Hey friend, Brandon here. When Apple Silicon burst into the scene in 2021, it changed the game because it was so dramatically powerful and insanely efficient even off the plug. Moving from an Intel Mac to an Apple Silicon Mac was and continues to be the most dramatically forward and experience I've ever had with computers. That's great for us, the consumers, but rough for Apple because it's harder to justify upgrading if the difference isn't dramatic. I've wanted to upgrade over the past few years, but I have not found enough reasons to upgrade every time I've run the test and compared it to my existing laptop. That changes with a new M4 series of MacBook Pros. Here are five reasons why it's time to upgrade, at least for me. And spoiler alert, one of the reasons is nano texture. Yeah, it kind of sounds ridiculous, but I ran many tests and comparisons, and this video will be the definitive resource to reference when talking about nano texture and whether or not it's worth it. Let's talk about why it's time to upgrade, because this is Tech Today. Now for context, in 2021, I purchased the M1 Max Apple MacBook Pro, which has a fully upgraded 10 core CPU, 32 core GPU processor, two terabytes of SSD, and 64 gigabytes of RAM. In this video, I compare it with the 14 inch upgraded M4 MacBook Pro with the same two terabyte SSD, but 48 gigabytes of RAM, 14 core CPU, and 20 core GPU to see if it's enough of an upgrade or if I'll need to move to an M4 Max instead. I primarily focus on editing in DaVinci Resolve. I don't do anything intense with photo editing other than making thumbnails in Photoshop, and I game on my desktop top PC. The main focus is honestly on practical use and DaVinci Resolve. The first reason I want to upgrade is the size, which has been a desire for a while. Over the years, my travel has increased. Recently, I traveled to South Korea and filmed an entire video on the iPhone 16 Pro Max, and I filmed my iPhone review in Japan. Since I have a Mac Studio at home, I don't need a big laptop screen. My laptop is mainly used when I travel, so size and weight are more important. A 16-inch laptop is too big to carry in a backpack while walking around a city or convention center for hours, or editing off of those tiny airplane tray tables, especially when someone leans back in their chair. Oh, it's so rough. Unfortunately, prior to generations have not been good enough to justify moving to a 14 inch, but this is still a factor. If a MacBook Pro is your only device, a 16 inch may make more sense, but I find 16 inches to be quite comically large in comparison. Beyond the screen, the other downside of going to the 14 inch is the thermals on the M4 Max models, which may limit the performance it could have compared to the 16 inch model. But the size and weight are a worthy trade off for me. But I will say from the tests I've seen, the performance differences between the sizes doesn't come up for video editing, so even more reason to not be concerned about it for me. If you're wondering about the screen real estate on a 14 inch compared to a 16 inch screen, when I edit in DaVinci Resolve, I change my resolution to the native resolution of the display, and I can see even more than on my 16 inch MacBook Pro in its see more resolution, so I don't mind. Reading tons of text isn't the focus of a video editing program compared to being able to see everything. If you are a video editor, give this a shot and I can still read the text just fine. Another thing you should see are the skins from channel sponsor Dbrand. They have several options that help protect your MacBook from scratches and give it a look that you want, like these new L LTT glow in the dark skins. The circuit board collab also is PCB accurate, which is incredible. They also have excellent dbrand grip cases and skins to protect your iPhone from drops and scratches. If you want to get your hands on the new LTT circuit board skins or the leather skins, which I happen to like quite a bit, check them out by clicking the link in the description. Now, battery is always a consideration, especially for travel. While the battery life is enough for all generations of Apple Silicon for everyday use at home or in the office, traveling is more complicated. Sometimes all the outlets are taken up at the airport, or you realize that you don't have the proper conversion plug while traveling abroad, or your power brick, as always, won't stay in those terrible outlets on the plane seat. What's up with that? There are many times that I've found myself working off the plug. Because of that, I can't justify moving backwards in battery life from my 16 inch M1 Max MacBook Pro to a 14 inch laptop while well, until now. The latest M4 series of processors is more powerful per core and more power efficient. Because of that, the 14 inch M4 Pro and Max match the battery life of the M1 Max and the 16 inch outperforms the 16 inch M1 Max. So if you're like me and want to move to a 14 inch model and are concerned about the battery difference, I think that hesitation is finally gone. One of the most important reasons I want to upgrade is the ability to fulfill more of my creative intent by utilizing tools and plugins when I'm editing my videos. For my videos, I utilize DaVinci Resolve for editing and collaborating. It's well optimized for Apple Silicon and has a constant stream of updates. Because of that, playback is relatively smooth and exports are really fast. I don't really need anything faster except for one area, text and plugins. I honestly didn't expect text to be so resource intensive in DaVinci Resolve, but it's incredibly demanding when using plugins for animated titles and other things. One of my favorite 
favorite plugin suites comes from Motion VFX, which I previously used while editing on Final Cut Pro. Unfortunately, I haven't used many of those plugins since moving to DaVinci Resolve because of how demanding those plugins are, to the point that they'll sometimes bring playback to a crawl. At best, the M1 Max will only play back between zero frames per second to two frames per second during these sections. On the M4 Pro, this changes to three frames per second, which may not seem like much of an improvement, but it at least allows for a semi-consistent playback compared to straight up freezing. This has a dramatic impact on export times. A timeline devoid of these plugins results in the M1 Max exporting notably faster. Adding a single plugin doesn't mess things up too much, as I saw an export time of 2 minutes and 57 seconds compared to the M4 Pro's 3 minutes and 18 seconds. However, when I add multiple plugins, the difference compounds and you begin to see how taxing plugins are on the M1 Max. In a test where I added only 5 title slides with this plugin, which is honestly quite basic, the export times flipped with the M1 Max taking 7 minutes and 49 seconds and the M4 Pro taking 6 minutes and 53 seconds. I can only imagine how this gap would compound and add up when I edit a video the way that I want to. On the M1 Max, if I wanted to use multiple instances of this plugin for title slides for each section, it would often freeze my project. I actually had one project that wouldn't export even after leaving it for 3 hours, which is highly stressful since that video had a deadline. I got lucky that I figured out that it was the plugins and removed them. Since then, I've only used basic title slides, but not the ones that I want. My creative intent is limited by the M1 Max, and this even happens on my M1 Ultra Max Studio, so doing this on the M4 Pro is incredible. It honestly makes me want to upgrade to the fully upgraded M4 Max for an even smoother experience, so I ordered one to swap out with this uh, M4 Pro. You got me, Apple. If you're not like me and you do not use plugins, the M1 Max has a faster export time than the M4 Pro. The M4 Max will likely have a quicker export time, but given the cost difference, it's not a dramatic enough difference to save you tons of time unless you're exporting something hours long. Editor Brandon here. I got really lucky and the M4 Max came in before I published the video. So, you know, I have two right here. So I ran the same test and I found that the export time on the video was four minutes and 31 one seconds long and that's a substantial decrease from the other laptops but the main pain point that I'm having is with the plugins and the performance gain on that is not as much as I was hoping it's maybe a half a frame to a whole frame better in terms of playback and export times in the plugin sections so I don't know if it's worth paying a whole thousand dollars more sure export times are are kind of insane overall uh, for the parts that are not complicated but I wasn't exactly dying over how long it was taking to export anyways. So I'm not really quite sure if the M4 Max is worth it. The M4 Pro seems like it's probably the one to get. I'm really considering staying with that one because, well, that's a whole thousand dollars that you're saving. If other creators are considering between the M4 Pro and the M4 Max, maybe it does make sense to stay with the M4 Pro. By the way, at the very, very end of this video, you'll see the export times for this video amongst all the three of them. Pretty crazy. Now, as for how it performs on export without plugins, the M1 Max exports four times the native frames per second, hitting over 90 frames per second on a 24 frames per second timeline. The M4 Pro is nearly three times the native frames per second at over 60 frames per second on export. One thing to note is that this performance strength disappeared when I used QuickTime to screen record on the M4 Pro. The M1 Max was still able to push through despite screen recording. This may be the result from significantly more GPU cores on the M1 Max, so I don't anticipate this being an issue on the M4 Max when I get it, but it's worth mentioning if you consider getting the M4 Pro. With the launch of the new M4 series of MacBook Pros, the option to add a nano texture display to help reduce reflections and glare was made available. And I'll be honest, I wasn't really interested in this since I didn't enjoy the nano texture on the iPad Pro. But my opinion changed when I saw the new MacBook Pros in person, even as much as saying it's something that I cannot live without anymore. Well, what makes it different is the angle. The iPad is usually laid down on a table or angled up while a laptop screen is aimed at you and not at a light. And that difference is significant. The light that hits it directly will diffuse in a broad area, which can be distracting, but this isn't as common with a laptop. In everyday situations, it looks incredible. I hadn't realized it until I saw them side by side, but the glossy display is exceptionally distracting and strains my eyes because you can see every reflection from your hands typing on the keyboard, your table, yourself, and more. It's just awful when viewing content that is dark or black, and while the nano texture diffuses across a wider area, the glossy display shows it with such intensity in a specific area that you can't see anything underneath it. If you have it angled at you, the nano 
texture looks more natural and easy on the eyes. When you don't have a light shining directly at it, the nano texture display has a shocking amount of contrast and color saturation greater than the glossy display and all of its reflections. Something about it feels like you can fully see the entire display while the glossy one is filled with reflections and distractions. The nano texture is like a movie projected onto a cinema screen, but at a higher brightness than the previous generation's glossy display. And somehow it does that without losing detail and sharpness. This may sound contradictory, but it looks less digital and harsh than the glossy display without losing any sort of detail. I don't know how they did that. Even when comparing the text clarity and sharpness up close, it's tough to notice a difference between the glossy and nano texture displays. In polls I ran on Twitter and threads, which you should follow me at This Is Tech Today, people were overwhelmingly choosing the nano texture display as the one with the better quality regarding sharpness and contrast. And I also don't see a color shift or difference between the nano texture or glossy display, which is critical for video and photo editors and designers. So what makes it unique? Many of you told me on threads that there's nothing new or unique about this and that Apple's just now catching up with displays that have been around for decades and that you can find a laptop for $300 that has that. Well, one could say a lot about those comments, but a matte display differs from a nano texture display. A typical matte display is a film or layer added on the screen to diffuse light, while nano texture is a process that etches the glass itself to diffuse light. It finally does its job without desaturating the colors, contrast, or adding a rainbow shift depending on the angle you're looking at. And that is why Apple finally brought anti-glare displays back. Many said that you can buy a $17 anti-glare screen protector for the same experience and that nano texture is overpriced marketing nonsense. So I decided to see if that was true and bought Amazon's highest rated, most reviewed anti-glare screen protector and well, it doesn't look very good. I, I just cannot express how bad this looks. It washes out the image so that the blacks are gray, colors are muted, and somehow there's more glare than on the glossy display to the point that I can't see anything on the screen. Everything from the table it's on, my hands, and the lighting around it reflects on it more than all the options tested. There's not a single angle that doesn't have more of that broad diffuse lighting on it. It's even worse than when lighting is pointed at it. Looking at all three options side by side reveals how crazy good and similar the contrast and saturation is on the nano texture compared to the glossy display. So no, an anti-glare screen protector is not even remotely close. Because of that, the nano texture is a fair upgrade for its price because it manages to do what it needs to do without the typical downsides you see from a matte display. It looks better than the glossy display to me while feeling more gentle on my eyes. Because of that, I never want to turn back to a glossy display. It's incredible. Check it out in person and truly experience it. Many have had concerns about durability and scratching, which is fair, especially when the texture is etched into the glass itself. All I can say is that this same nano texture process is used on the iPad Pros, something designed with touch in mind and the Apple Pencil. And there hasn't been any sort of scratch gate regarding that. I would call it out here if that was a widespread issue. So it's safe to assume that a laptop screen that you hardly touch with nano texture will be fine. Just wipe it down with a screen cleaning wipe and a microfiber cloth like you would with any other screen. They even include one in the box. This is a value now, it's like 30 or 40 bucks. As for concerns about the keyboard rubbing on the screen and scratching it, well, that even happens on my glossy display. I think we focus too much on the new thing and have a heightened concern about it when it's no different than the alternative. If you want to avoid scratching your screen from your keyboard, you can get a microfiber cloth to cover your keyboard to protect it from the screen, like this one that I have here is linked down below in the description. Overall, I think the nano texture upgrade is worth it and a fair value for its benefit and quality, but I'd love to know what you think in the comments. Now this last one is a nerdy economic thing, but the rate at which these laptops are losing value because of how powerful Apple Silicon is becoming, even in the lower tier models, is taking a lot of resale value out of the M1 series generation of Macs. Since the M4 series MacBook Pros came out, third-party sales and Apple trade-ins have dropped about $500. While private third-party sales can be sold for about $1,800 down from the $2,350 I saw just a few weeks ago. If I wait an additional year or two, I'll likely lose almost the entire value of my M1 Max MacBook Pro, which would make an upgrade far more expensive than the $1,000 or $2,000 upgrade price if I switch over now. And that depends on whether I get the M4 Pro or M4 Max. So that means if I wait until the rumored body refreshes in 2026, I may pay close to the entire $4,000 price to upgrade, which is harder to swallow. There may be more exciting things to consider, but I think this is a valuable perspective to think about. And here's a bonus reason to upgrade now, and it's Apple Care. This sounds silly and it's really mostly my fault, but I purchased the two year M1 Max MacBook Pro Apple Care plan, which has expired. The real move is to buy a yearly plan that continues until you cancel it. That way you're covered for the inevitable three to five years of life that these laptops will easily give you. Upgrading allows me to switch to that setup. Now these reasons are personal to me and my use case, but I'd love to know if any of them resonate with you or if you still aren't convinced to upgrade. Let me know in the comments. If you wanna purchase a new Mac, please check out the links in the description as they help support the channel. Also check out 
all my videos on the iPhone here and here. This review is made possible because I purchased these MacBooks. Apple has no influence or control over this video and no money has exchanged hands. Thanks for watching. This is Tech Day. Until next time.